am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. During the last podcast, episode 41 of Journey Through the Scriptures, we read about the dragon, the woman and her son and who and what they represented. Naturally, when it comes to interpreting the symbols in this chapter, there are a lot of differing opinions surrounding these characters and what they represent. For instance, many well-known Bible commentators feel that the third of the stars that were swept from the sky by the dragon's tail, mentioned in chapter 12 verses 4, are angels and not Jewish leaders. But it is important that we should focus always on the message and not on the words. Whether these stars are angels or men is not as important as what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us through John. Currently, Satan has access to heaven. He does not reside there, but often he appears before God to accuse believers. Revelation 12 verses 10 tells us this. Job chapter 1 verses 6 to 12 tells a story of Satan appearing before the throne of God to accuse Job and to seek permission to attack his body. However, in the midst of the tribulation, as we will discover now, Satan will lose his access to heaven. Bible scholars differ on whether this specific reference to a third of the stars of the heaven is a reference to Satan's work of corrupting one third of the angels of heaven or if it points to his immense earthly power at this time. Either way, Satan and all the rebelling demons will be cast down and barred from their normal access and communication with God. This appears in Revelation 12 verses 7 to 9. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. This is a sudden change of scene. We are no longer looking at the events on earth, but looking into heaven and seeing a scene of conflict invisible to earth but taking place in heaven. This is the first reference to Michael in this book. Who is this Michael? We can tell by what he is doing. He is fighting against the great red dragon. We first meet Michael in the Old Testament prophecy of Daniel in chapter 12 verses 1. Here Michael is called the great prince who has charge of your people, that is, the people of Daniel, who are the Jews. The return of Michael in Revelation 12 is yet another indication that Israel is at the forefront of the events of this book, and Israel is in focus here, symbolized by the woman, representing the believing remnant of Israel. Up to this point, Satan has access to heaven. In the book of Job, he appears before God and requests permission to attack the body of Job. In the book of Zechariah, he is also seen accusing the believers before God in heaven. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 verses 12 that we believers today are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, other people are not really our problem. It is what the devil is doing to people that makes them oppose us. It is through the wicked spirits which he calls the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. But at this point in Daniel's 70th week, God sends Michael, the great archangel, with his angels and together they force the devil and his angels out of heaven and hurl them to the earth. We have already seen a description of this in symbolic form back in Revelation chapter 9 verses 1 where we saw a great star fall from heaven onto the earth, and from it emerged one who came from the bottomless pit. Other accounts of this fall of Satan are to be found in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. I will let you read these passages in your own time. In the next verses, Revelation 12 verses 10 to 12, the reaction of heaven to this casting out of the devil is recorded. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. 
and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This loud voice that John hears seems to come from the martyrs of chapter 6, who were given white robes and who are seen under the altar crying out to God, How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They are the ones who now rejoice that the devil has been cast out of heaven. They speak of the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before our God. The brothers here would be the believing Jews, the remnant of Israel, who are still on earth during these days. The loud voice in heaven announces that the time has come for the Lord Jesus to reign over the kingdom long ago promised to Israel. At this time, I would like to stop at verse 11 and focus on how the believers of any age can overcome the evil schemes of the devil as he attempts to deceive us, neutralize us, and immobilize us with the poisonous emotion of guilt. This verse says, They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. We are assaulted by the devil continually. Lies and misleading philosophies assault our senses from every side today. These philosophies are wrong and hurtful and are widely believed and spread. We are being accused before the presence of God and in our hearts we hear these accusations by the devil. We need to know how to answer the accusations. There are three steps to take. Firstly, they conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. We have all heard the devil accusing us. I am sure that you have heard that inner voice that says, What kind of Christian are you? Look at what you have done. How could God ever love you? What makes you think you are acceptable in His sight? You are worthless. How does one answer that? According to this text, you must admit it, because it is true. We make mistakes all the time. It is true. We believe lies, we act selfishly, we are malicious and self-indulgent at times. We hurt others thoughtlessly. It is all true and we should admit it. But then remind the devil of the blood of the Lamb, the cross of Christ. On that cross, Jesus bore our sins so that we are no longer to be judged and even accused before God. What does Paul tell us in Romans 8 verses 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the power of the blood of the Lamb. There is no way to answer Satan and avoid the guilt and shame of which he accuses us without resting upon the work of the cross and the blood of the Lamb. Paul declares in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When the Lord Jesus makes us new creatures, Satan can only accuse you of something that is past and gone. So, by trusting and relying on the blood of the Lamb, we have exercised faith. Secondly, in verse 11, it says that they overcame the devil by the word of their testimony. As believers, we need to share with others what Christ has done for us. How many of us here have come to Christ because of the testimony of someone else? They shared the joy and peace that the Lord Jesus had brought into their life, and it was by the word of their testimony that you came to Christ. By sharing the word of our testimony, we are exercising love towards others who have been deceived and bound by Satan's lies. Finally, in verse 11 it says that they loved not their lives even unto death. They would give up anything but Christ. They cared more for his honor and truth than all their possessions, all their status before men, even their own lives. It was apparent from their actions that nothing was worth more to them than Christ's presence in their lives. They would rather die than deliberately bring shame to his name. They have laid hold of the hope of the Christian faith, the hope that the loss of possessions, honor, and life itself is nothing compared to the promised inheritance of eternal life with Jesus. Can we do that today? This is the way to overcome Satan, by faith, hope, and love. We exercise faith in the blood of the cross. We show love towards others who are bound by Satan's lies by testifying about what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. We lay hold of the hope of a Christian. 
which is that death is rendered meaningless because life itself means nothing compared to the promised inheritance of eternal life with Jesus. Now that causes great rejoicing in heaven as verse 12 reveals. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Satan is enraged by this resistance. He realizes that his time is short because in only three and a half years he is going to be bound and thrown into a bottomless pit. He therefore moves quickly as verses 13 to 17 say, When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. It is important to understand that this woman does not represent the whole nation of Israel. In other words, all the Jews on the earth. But this woman is really a representation of the remnant, the believing part of Israel in those days. Already there have been judgments upon the Jews as promised in the prophets. This is the time of Jacob's trouble, which is found in Jeremiah chapter 30. The unbelieving Jews have been eliminated. Only the remnant will escape here. God cares for and protects this believing remnant. They are given the two wings of the great eagle. This is the same phrase that is used in Exodus 19 verses 4 to describe how God led the nation of Israel out of Egypt. So it is a picture of God's loving protection and the care of the remnant of His people in that day. This particular verse has been used by many Bible teachers in the USA to suggest that the US Air Force and the USA as a nation will somehow be involved in this rescuing of the remnant of Israel because the eagle symbol features so prominently in the armed forces of the USA. This is the case of reading something into the scripture that is not there. This is part of the heretical teachings of American Zionism that says that America is the new Israel and that they were now God's chosen people. The water, like a river, referred to in verse 15, is very likely a symbol for the huge army of soldiers that have been sent by the beast or the Antichrist to destroy Israel. We have seen that symbolism before, where invading armies are described as a mighty flood. Depictions in the book of Revelation are extremely dramatic, and are often meant to be entirely symbolic. Others seem to be more literal. So it is not entirely impossible that someone might attempt to use flooding as a weapon. It is doubtful, though, that the dragon would send a river of water to sweep away the escaping Jews. But, in verse 16, the very earth protects her. It is probably a reference to the natural disasters that occur during these days, like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and hailstorms. The prophet Ezekiel describes the same event in chapter 38, verses 18 to 22. Here is what that prophecy says. On that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger. For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath I declare, on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the cliffs shall fall, and every wall shall tumble to the ground. With pestilence and bloodshed I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So the Antichrist will be diverted from attacking the faithful Jews of Israel, symbolized by the woman, and will instead turn his attention to the rest of her offspring and make war against them. But who is John describing exactly in this phrase? If the woman who flees into the desert on the wings of eagles is the believing remnant of Israel, then most likely the rest of her offspring refers to the 144,000 Jews that we first met in Revelation 7 and will meet again in Revelation 14 because it says specifically that the rest of her offspring will keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. 
These are Jewish evangelists who move throughout the earth, preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations. The devil gives his final attention to destroying this group because of their powerful and effective witness to the world. The fury of the devil will increase as he grows more and more desperate, knowing that his time is short. Like any wild and dangerous beast, the devil becomes more deadly and ferocious as he is backed into a corner. I am sure that you can sense that the pace of the events in the book of Revelation is now quickening. God's plan in human history is climaxing towards its final fulfillment. For just a moment, let us pull back from this examination of future events and look at the world around us. Are you astonished with the swiftly moving pace of world events today? Things are happening with breathtaking speed. Already we are in the second half of 2021, and yet it seems that only a short while ago, it was still 2020. Life is accelerating like floating down a river that is approaching a waterfall. As we near the waterfall, the current speeds up. We may very well be coming close to the days described here. There is one important question that this chapter leaves with us to answer. How are you doing in your personal battle with Satan? Have you learned to overcome him, to live as an overcomer in the desperate conditions of today? Are you relying daily upon Jesus and his blood as the source of your righteousness? Are you sharing the word of your testimony with others? Have you placed all you have on the altar of Jesus Christ? We can only overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and loving not our lives unto death. Nothing should be more important to us than the ministry our Lord Jesus has given to us in this day. That is to live our lives before the world as He enables us to live through Him and in Him. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 42.